Good morning, good morning, and happy Friday. Julian here, get the pleasure of hosting global trading experts, Boris and Kathy. How are we doing this morning, guys? Great. We had a great live trading session, and so we're ready to rock and roll. I love yeah, it. I love it. Boris, how are you doing today? Oh, Bobby and weaving with the markets, man. That's exactly <laughs> what we're doing. Exactly. exactly. Well, let's go ahead yeah. and dive right into it. Uh, you know, obviously, it's been a very heavy week uh, with Powell testifying to the Senate and to the House. So I'll let you guys kind of take it from here. Yeah, well, I mean, all of this is the buildup to the end of the month FOMC Federal Reserve meeting. And so it's all about, you know, what is the Federal Reserve going to do? So we have Powell and Mark really hoped that he was going to give us some transparency. And while he's leaning towards 50, you know, 25 is still on the table. So it was all up to today's report, not farm payrolls. And um, it was confusing at first, but I think, you know, the market settled on to how it feels. Um, the headline number was great. 300 something thousand against 200 something thousand expected, but the guts were um, terrible. You know, average hourly earnings growth slowed, the unemployment rate increased. So as a result, the dollar fell and U.S. yields fell. So markets now thinking, you know, I don't know, you know, um, it's still guessing. And that was what will make volatility here to stay this week and next week. By the way, you hear the sirens? You hear the sirens? So yep. this is every time we trade from the city, I trade from the city, we play this game. It's called truck, police, or ambulance. And you have to, you have to identify <laughs> what siren it is. This is I'm 11 stories up. Windows are sealed. I mean, they're sealed shut. This is this is not open windows. You get the feeling of what, what, how loud the city is. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I, I, I kind of agree with, with, you know, with Kate. I had tweeted out earlier this week, if any of you, and by the way, all of you should really, really follow Kathy because she she puts out excellent tweets. There's, there was a trader in our room today, actually. This is such an important point. And if you follow Kathy, you'll never make this mistake in your life, I promise you. So the trader in the room was um, trading Sergio Disha, you know, and she was like, oh, my God, I got so badly clipped. I, I didn't realize that I walked myself into the news, right? And I think that's such an important point. It doesn't matter how technically oriented you are. Nobody walks in front. Nobody walks in front of a, a oncoming train. Um, so there are really only about maybe five, six, if you're trading FX, maybe eight pieces of news during the month that are really important. Where if you are a short-term trader, you definitely want to stand down until the news happens because you're just there's two things that happens. You get volatility. Right, which moves your way, and then the much worse part is you get slippage, which means that not only is you know uh, because news is happening, there's gaps in pricing. Your stops are going to get blown at much larger rates. So the risk to the trader is enormous if you don't understand that you're standing in front of news. Anyways, my point being is that Kathy is the fund, the queen, and she will warn you ahead of time on any important news event. In the FX market, which, by the way, of course, is also going to intersect the uh, the indices market as well, because anything that's important to FX is going to be important to indices. So and, you know, she puts out a really, really nice like start of the week tweet of like what's important on the calendar. So you should really, really follow her. Kathy Lean FX and only Kathy Lean FX and no other Twitter follower <laughs> and no other Instagram and no other stuff, because we all know how many fraudsters there are over there that imitate her. Plus, you know, uh, I will never, ever, ever spell my own name wrong. So if someone is direct <laughs> messaging you with Kathy, L-E-I-N, or K-A-A-T-H-Y, that is not me. I will never, right. ever spell my own name wrong on any platform. Right. But the yeah. easiest thing to do is to make sure that you follow the correct um, Kathy Lean FX on Twitter, you'll never, and then any other, any other Kathy Lean, anybody else who comes into chats, you, you know that they're just trying to steal, steal, literally steal your money. Um, and then, you know, you also follow me as well, FX Flow. Um, I'm primarily going to be commenting on the indices markets, but I will occasionally, you know, chime in with a macro view. And I had this point of view this last week uh, when, when, when Powell was, was testifying and everybody was like, oh, my God, he's going to 50. Oh, he's so hawkish. And oh, my God, look at the market falling down. And I um, categorically did not believe a word that he was saying, because I think um, Chairman Powell is a master at creating room to maneuver. He's an incredibly diplomatic, very, very savvy, very cagey policymaker. If you watch him, he is smooth as silk all the time. He just sort of is able to, I think, you know, navigate the most uh, adversarial waters. With, it makes you feel like, you know, he's just so calm and placid. But what he does is what he did is he basically made room for the ability for them to go 50 in case 
the data was super hot in case they had to, in case, but there was never, in my opinion, an intention to go 50 um, on the policy. Now, I could have egg on my face because next week he could completely surprise me and just go 50. But, you know, let's let's uh, let's mark this moment and see if I'm right. My general view is that um, the Fed likes to talk tough, but act very conventionally because it understands at how precarious. I mean, it understands that literally in the modern economy, I think there is just the Fed and nobody else because the political situation in almost every country in the world is so incredibly fractured. And so um, what's the word? Uh, dysfunctional, right? Yeah. <laughs> that um, the only source of power in the world is the central banks. And I think they take themselves very seriously and they clearly know they can wreck the economy or nurse the economy back to health. So I think, you know, they're trying to do the best they can in terms of navigating a middle course. Uh, we'll see if I'm right. But my prediction as we stand right now is it's going to be 25 bips um, on the okay. next. So speaking of the calendar and knowing what's on the calendar, right. Fed announcement is in two weeks on March 22nd and ECB announcement is next week right. on right. the 16th. Is that the Thursday? Yeah, the 16th. Right. And um, next week is very special because we have daylight savings in the U.S. on Sunday. And Europe also has daylight savings, but that doesn't happen until a week later on March 26. So, you know, speaking of knowing when things come out, everyone is used to ECB making their announcement at 8.15 um, Eastern time. But um, because we have this one week, you know, weird um, gap in the change of daylight savings, next week um, ECB announcement is actually at 9.15 New York time. So make sure you're on top of that, because if you don't, you know, know when things are coming out, you'll get sideswiped, like Boris said. And, um, you know, we make it we talk about it all the time with our traders. Um, we give a very important priority to understand what's on the calendar. So that's you know, something that's very important for the for next week and the rest of the month. But then after that, we go back to, you know, regular schedule for ECB. Yeah. By the way, can we all agree that we all hate daylight savings time? Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay. So it throws you off the routine. Now, Boris, whether you want to touch on it now or, or just kind of wait a little bit, especially yeah. for the viewers, uh, those kind of, you know, six or eight news reports that come out that that are, you know, significant that we need sure. to look at. I think those are huge, you know, for, for the folks watching today. Yeah. So, I mean, I think when you look at the OECD world, the G7, you know, uh, world, those uh, – there are really only three, and Cam, I'll let Kathy, of course, chime in because she's she's the the professional here. I'm just the amateur. Uh, there's just three primary primary uh, events that people should really focus on: the central bank announcement, because of course that sets monetary policy and economic policy going forward, right? Um, inflation, because inflation is front and center, you know, globally now. It's the CPI number, and then the employment number, you know, in each re in each country. Right. And, you know, Kay, you may want to talk to the fact about how the Anglo-Saxon countries like the Australia, Canada, um, it, just Australia, Canada, and New Zealand have like this whole idea of uh, 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 temporary and full time employment that sometimes it's a little, you know, it, it's a little hard to read the underlying. Um, yeah. I mean, that. jobs reports are always tricky. Right. Because it's like today, you know, um, if you watched the, the video I put on YouTube, about what to expect for NFPs. I'm not uh, every social I have, YouTube, Twitter. I talked about how, you know, when it comes to NFPs, you know, there are three things to watch. The headline number, actually four things to watch. The headline number, the revisions, the unemployment rate, and earnings. And we talked about how the most important thing is actually not the headline number. And it's probably going to be on um, the wage growth because it's what the Fed watches. Um, and that's what happened today. The headline number was great. You know, 300 something against 200 something, I don't get mired in details, but um, the average hourly um, earnings growth slowed. And that was bad news because that's linked to consumer spending, which everyone's worried about. So that is why that's true for all of the other countries. Now, all, not all of them release wage growth, but Canada today, um, one of the main reasons why it was positive for Canada is because wage growth s jumped significantly. Um, and then with the other countries like um, Australia, New Zealand, and even Canada, they split it up into full-time and part-time jobs. So, you know, with, with jobs report, the bottom line is with any country, it is best to trade it what we called reactively, which means, you know, there's two ways to trade news, um, proactively or reactively. 
I love to do it proactively, but it's a special skill. You have to be able to handicap the data. But reactively is accessible by everyone because you wait for the number to come out, then you react to it. Um, and so wait for the number to come out. Wait at least five minutes because sometimes you have no idea what's important, right? Like you're looking at the head nine number. It's great. You know, you, have, you think, you know, this should be good for the dollar, but it's not. So you let the market wait five minutes. Let the market figure itself out. Let the initial volatility settle and then get it. That's exactly how we traded post NFP today. We went long euro dollar. We went short dollar CAD, caught pips on both ends. But we had to wait, and it was the most excruciating five minutes, Julian. We did that last time when we live traded together. We had five minutes. It was excruciating. Yep. And but then that's how we ended up with the best trades because we let dust settle, and then we got it. Absolutely. Like you said, good advice. I mean, waiting on, until you really see how the market plays out before you jump in because, you know, like you said, otherwise you're just kind of setting yourself up for you're just going on a roller coaster ride. And, you know, so – Going back to today's trading, because I'm, I'm just looking at the charts today and there's some really, really interesting, you know, carve out patterns. Um, you know, actually, hang uh, hang a sec. Let me see if I can pull it on my chart. I wonder if I could. Um, I, I'll just take I'm, I'm going to take something very simple like US 30, which I know I know, Julian, you absolutely love. Yeah. Right. Um, and hang on. Let me just uh, let me just adjust it so it's not so. uh Give me just one sec. I just want to. Otherwise, my chart is going to look like it's Valentine's Day massacre here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I wonder if. Um, so, how could I share my chart? Do I have to go back into? Let me see if I can do this. Uh, so, Julian, you did you trade today? I did actually. Uh, I actually jumped in, kind of a. A short little scout move on gold, as you saw it, you know, really pumped on the, you know, upward uh, yeah. move. And I, I caught a little bit of that. Obviously, now we're starting to get a little bit of rejection here. But, uh, you know, of course, as usual, trying to play the support resistance, you know how it is, you know, higher yeah. levels, that kind of you deal. Know, so. Speaking of rejection, this is, you know, I talk a lot about knowing what to trade, when to trade. And right now, you know, we're, we're live streaming at 11 a.m. New York time, which is going into London close. And so oftentimes, whatever happens, in my experience, um, oftentimes reverses close to the London close and there's payback. So I think what you're seeing is norm. And you know what? Oftentimes that's tradable as well. Yeah, exactly. So um, I wonder if I'm just see if I can. Uh, uh, so you guys are seeing this is a NASDAQ chart. It, it, you know, it really doesn't matter. I'm just can you zoom up in a little bit for us. No. Zoom. No, it doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter. I, I can't zoom in. I just, I just want to. It's a principle of the thing. I just want to do a quick principle of the thing. The black line underneath here, right? So remember, this is positive news. You see this little green, um, tr you know, rectangle. This is what. This is our indicator making money. You know, like when we live traded with you guys when we were in Naples, I was using this indicator to make money and so on and so forth, right? So it kind of, you know, pops up. So it's sort of like positive news for Nasdaq, right? But this is the bottom line of the box. Like this is the low pre-news right and so you have this is something that's very very um common that happens in news trading where you have positive move and this is the key thing if the move is completely reversed completely reversed to the lows of the pre-news it's usually good for some real nice continuation in other words if they take out if they take out the bottom of this the great trade here wouldn't have been to buy it it was to sell it to go you know there was another there was another 40, 50 points of NASDAQ over here that you could have made very easy money because it eventually it did turn around, but you would have been in very deep drawdown if you just simply decided to buy it here, but you would have made very quick profits because once they take out the stops, the, the stops pre-news, that's a great, great setup to go the other way. That means that whatever the um, information was here was completely reversed. They, tr they basically broke the bottoms and then only after they kind of, you know, take the stops over here, they finally consolidate. And maybe now, now maybe for the rest of the day, going to run it back up to the highs. And by the way, here's the other point of view. This is the high of the day, the green line. Um, if we take out the high of the day, we're going to go higher. That's my prediction. So one of the interesting ways to kind of really look at this is look at these key levels because it's news against key levels. If you can combine both of them, you have a deadly combination of accuracy in terms of being able to trade news well. So um, the, so basically the top side board you're saying is that 12,056 green line on top. And then yeah. the bottom is the 11,855. Um, Those are the two levels we should be watching, right? 
Yes, correct. My, but I guess my, my, but my, my original point was the news box was like this black line on the bottom. We broke once. Once we took out the lows of the news box, the great trade was to the short side. Is it you possible make, for you to sh use the highlighter to show us exactly where the break is? Because um, you could get the highlighter in the upper left hand corner. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Highlighter. So this is right over here. Is so right over yeah. here. This is pre, this is pre this is pre news right. This is pre news lows. We spike because because the market says oh. Uh, Fed is definitely doing 25 off of this. That's positive stocks, positive, especially positive NASDAQ. By the way, so the other interesting thing is what is the most positive index towards or the most interest rate sensitive index? It's NASDAQ, right? Because NASDAQ is all high technology companies. They live and die by cheap money. The cheaper the money, the, the better it is for NASDAQ. So therefore, it, it's the most sensitive to um, any kind of a shift in sentiment on interest rates. So interest rates shift here now goes to the downside. That means NASDAQ goes to the upside. We saw, we moon, we moon as the crypto bros say, uh, all the way up you know, to the, to the highs. But here's the thing, very, very soon, about an hour later, we completely reverse the moon and break the lows. Once we break the lows, that is your signal to get short because that is a great trade here. It's Basically, 1912 all the way down to 1850. That is a 50 point trade in five minutes. Basically, you know, easy money, easy money right here. Now, what I'm saying is, OK, now we finally consolidated. Now, you know, everybody kind of we, we ran the stops. The dealers were able to run the stops both ways. Now, if the market settles down and says, you know what, uh, economy is actually pretty good. Fed's gone 25. Maybe this is actually relatively decent for stocks. Maybe we're going to start bidding it into the open, in, into the close. And if they start bidding it into the close, my argument here is if they start bidding it into the close of the day and take out the high at the 12,000 mark, we're going higher. We're going higher. If they take out the high, we're going higher. I think there's going to be there's going to be more just because what happens is all the shorts over here who thought they were so smart are going to start really panicking as they drive it up into the in, into the highs of the day on the close. And they're, they're going to want to hold it over the weekend. So you know we'll we'll see the price action, see how that goes. But that's basically it. Um, how is my how's my incredibly uh, uh, childlike annotation there, Kay? You like it? <laughs> no, that was good. So much more sense to me because I was watching and I wasn't sure exactly what you were referring to. So this really, you know, set my sights okay. on the points I was supposed to be looking at. Now that's okay. good. What happens if it goes to the, so what are we looking at the downside? 1185? If it breaks 1185, yes. what do yes. we do? So, so yes. Yeah. So let me, let me just get my, my cursor here. It's hard uh, to, you know, maybe it could happen. Uh, so, you know, right. And by the way, you know, if you look at, if you look at my indicator here, you see, this is the midpoint right here. This sort of sort of the point of balance, right? Right over here is the point of balance. It's 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 the balance between the bulls and the bears for you know for the day, right? So now we're just a little bit below the midpoint. We're above the midpoint. We're basically trying to figure out are we gonna are we gonna you know take them higher, take them lower? If we kind of just chop around here and start moving down, then it really you know, there's certainly you know a very very strong chance we we test the lows, you know test the lows over here, um, you know for the rest of the day. But um, you know. As far as taking positional cues, you definitely want to wait, uh, in my opinion, until um, the market really, really breaks either the highs or the lows right now. Because otherwise, we're just in no man's land chopping around. And you, you could get whipsawed here very easily. They test it up, test it down, test it up, test it up. Yeah. People basically not making up in their minds. Once they break the day's highs or they break the day's lows, they really made up their minds which way they want to go. And that's where you, uh, you pretty much want to follow. Yeah, get a little bit more of a trending market. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So you know, so so that's you know that's equities today, uh, and obviously you know next week we have maybe you know we can talk a little bit about all the stuff that um, that's on the calendar. Kay can can walk people through and just see what what she thinks about maybe some of the FX trades. Um, and you can you know uh, I'll stop sharing and maybe you can share your screen, Kay. Um, sure. Let me um, share my screen. Now, now, Kathy, what are you looking for in the in the FX world? Um, well, you know, the main focus, in my opinion, is going to be, um, sorry, let me just make sure I grab the right win window. The main focus, in my opinion, is going to be the euro dollar. Um, ECB is, um, is meeting, and they're expected to raise interest rates 50 basis points um, with more to come. I mean, they've been unambiguously hawkish. And as Boris mentioned earlier, there's nothing more important to um, FX moves than central bank rate decisions. 
And that's why we always like to say, uh, put yourself in the shoes of Central Bank and think about what they could do and listen to what they're saying. And when the message is crystal clear, like the European Central Bank, who said nothing but we need to do, do 50 and more, then that's a trade you need to be in. That's why I really jumped into Euro after NFPs. And I think there's still upside opportunity because you can see the dollar um, remains under pressure. Euro um, is at 106.72. If I go to my daily chart, you know, we have some resistance at the 50 SMA, which I don't love, but I don't think it's really going to hold us back all that much. I think that um, the the fact that the ECB, when some central banks are almost done, the ECB is plowing ahead, that's going to be free reign for Euro to move higher. Now, with that as said, you know, Euro could be um, even more attractive against, you know, Euro Aussie, which is already, you know, through the moon. These are old drawings that I had. Um, and then also, you know, maybe um, Euro Pound, um, which is uh, kind of cheap right now. We have nothing going on for UK next week. So that kind of gives the opportunity for a long Euro Pound. Now, US dollar, though, don't give, don't, you know, ignore that because um, at the end of the day, Julia, we, didn't really get too much clarity from NFPs. Markets decided that it's bearish dollars, but they're not really still, they're not, I don't think they've really um, made their mind up about whether it's gonna be 25, 50. So next week's data will go a long way. We have retail sales, we have inflation. And um, inflation, like Boris mentioned, um, is uh, in some ways even more important than the jobs report. Because the Fed has said, you know, the main thing they're worried about is not the labor market. They feel the labor market is tight and strong. What they're really worried about is this is whether they can get their handle on inflation. So the inflation report that we get next week, and I personally like to feel, follow the daily FX calendar. Um, I helped to build daily FX. So I, um, you know, kind of create the backbone of this comprehensiveness. So next week um, we have, I believe on, um, Wednesday is the retail sales report. Um, so we've got the retail sales report happening on Wednesday. And that basically is after the inflation report on Tuesday. So Tuesday with the US inflation report. So that's going to be very important. It's going to be very market moving, probably even more market moving than today's NFP. And if you watch the markets, you know, he has a big move today. So if you like volatility, this is the number to watch. And taking a look at the forecast, the market is looking for softer data. Uh, they're looking for inflation to ease, which we kind of feel like, you know, is the case because gas prices have kind of stabilized. Oil prices have come down a little bit. We don't see retailers raising prices. We don't see travel costs really. I think most Americans feel this and the number is going to reflect it. So if it does, um, then, you know, we could have an extended decline in the U.S. dollar. Um, which you know would really you know help euros um, going into ECB, and then after that, as I said on Wednesday, we've got retail sales. So consumer spending is the backbone of the U.S. economy. It's a little hard for me to believe that it's going to contract, like this forecast says. The forecast just shows minus zero point one percent contraction. It's kind of hard for me to believe it's going to be that bad. Um, a large part of it has to do with autos. You can see below there, autos are expected to be. Um, uh, to drag it down, but these are the numbers to watch. And then we have, you know, some other data, which we'll talk about on Monday, um, job reports from other countries, but for, um, for the markets, for the equity markets, for the FX markets, for the bond markets, it's going to be US CPI, retail sales, and the ECB rate decision. These three, these are the three things to watch next week. Um, yeah. and I think it's going to be a very, very, it's going to be a very active week. And, you know, um, Volatility means opportunity in our books. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the narrative right now, as we stand um, on Friday, is that the Fed is 25 basis points. Economy is muddling on through. Inflationary pressures are existent, but not uh, accelerating. And labor pressures are muted. Sort of like that's that's the narrative, right? Now we get CPI next week. And let's say it comes in, you know, 20 basis points, 30 basis points hotter than expected. That blows that narrative right out of the water. So I think that's what that's what's so interesting about the market these days is that we literally go. It's a schizophrenic market. We go from complete, you know, uh, perfect happiness to to abject misery within a week. Literally the whole market. It's amazing how the narrative will just shift by every commentator, every market strategist. Oh, you know, 
uh, the Fed has to go to 8% uh, rates. I mean, just some absurd numbers that people are throwing out that have nothing, no anchoring in reality to like, you know, the Fed is going to be, is going to done, is going to done um, uh, hiking rates at, four, you know, at five. Like you just have these extreme uh, um, views all the time based upon the absolute latest, you know, piece of narrative. So I think that's why it's another reason why CPI will be so important next week, because we're going to be watching uh, just really honestly, at this point, it'll be important only in a sense that, uh, it can blow up that narrative. If it confirms the narrative, I think it will be actually positive stocks, negative dollar, positive carry, and even more positive euro. So if you if we get, I think Kay is going to agree with me. Like if we get this this perfect combination of easy U.S. CPI and hawkish Lagarde, you know, euro euro moons, you know. Yeah, well, I just want to show. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, piggybacking off of that, you know, how do we get ourselves to, obviously, Powell always talks about 2%. How do we, you know, of course, it, we, that may take a while to get there, but how do we get down to those numbers, you know, based off of the news that we're, you know, we're just enlightening? I, I, I think that the 2% figure will not, we will not see 2% for another two years, okay. probably. I think, I think, you know, I think the 4% is a new 2%, you know, just like, you know, yeah. black is the, I think that's kind of how we have to look at it. And, you know, honestly, inflation is really a function of, of, um, people getting comfortable. You know, it's just like, it's not, the, the, the really hard part about inflation is the initial jump. It's just like change. People people hate change, right? They hate radical change from one to the other because inflation literally is what that is. It's just radical change. You know, your, your eggs were a dollar, now they're three, right? But now there's three, uh, they're, they're actually not even three, they're back to a dollar. But let's just use eggs as a, because that's everybody's favorite, um, you know, example of, of, of inflation. Uh, but now they're three and they're just staying three. They're not going to six. They're not going to nine. They're just at three. So, you so you know, you get used to that and you're fine. And, and, and that's the whole point about, I think, inflation. It's not necessarily us going back to, you know, eggs being a dollar. It's just eggs not going to six. It's just I think the Fed first function is to make sure that we don't go any further, you know, with radical jumps higher. Um, and then slowly maybe we can we can shift back down. I think um, I need to shop where you shop for us because I have not seen eggs at three in, in two years, probably. I don't know. It's been a while since could, I've seen eggs so, at three. So, <laughs> by, by the way, by the way, you could so tell that I haven't gone to the supermarket yeah. in like a thousand years. That basically the only eggs I buy are from my bodega down the street, which the guys make it yeah. for me. <laughs> Egg, egg and cheese and uh you know that i literally don't pay any attention to, to supermarket prices so yes so I'm, I'm a terrible example of um, actual prices but i'm just trying to give you a a, a thesis so i the, my point is that, that yeah i mean they're going to be talking about two percent but nobody in the market really expects two percent the most important part is that we don't we don't permanently go to like five or six and stay there you know we if, if we can just calm ourselves down basically i think cpi at three percent now will be in many ways, I would argue healthy because um, because it means that growth is actually um, there. You know, one of the interesting things I read, uh, my friend Ben Carlson put it this very, very interesting piece of research saying that surprisingly, stock markets actually rally many over across many, many uh, examples of higher interest rates. Right. And people are like, how could that be? You know, you think, you know, higher interest rates are, are just a death to the stock market. They are if you are in a kind of a recessionary, stagflationary environment. But if higher interest rates are a function of both, you know, inflation and economic growth, which is what we have. In other words, uh, the Fed is kind of raising rates just to keep, you know, just to keep the things from everybody, you know, spending all their money right away, just, you know, keep the uh, economy uh, contained. Then actually that's positive because that means companies are selling more units. Their margins are staying relatively healthy. Um, they're getting productivity gains. And then, you know, bottom line is that, net, you know, real earnings are actually uh, going to improve. And that's long term positive for the stock market. OK, good. Yeah. So I actually wanted to um, show my charts um, quickly, Julian, because yeah. speaking, we're talking about the U.S. dollar and we're talking about how to um, look at the data that's coming out next week and how to position for it. So, you know, right now you're looking at my daily dollar yen chart of a whole spaghetti of moving averages. I love moving averages. But the point that I want to make with this chart is that um, we've dropped, we're dropped below quite a few, 20, 50, uh, one, uh, 200 SMA. And we've got a lot of resistance above in dollar yen. And from the looks of this chart, it looks like, you know, we've got um, room to go from 135 down to about 133 in dollar yen. And if you look at my um, zip chart, which is what, you know, I use for my day-to-day -day trading, 
um, you know, we had this off of the um, uh, NFP move. But as long as we are in the red zone, which is sell zone territory, that's when I'm going to be um, looking for opportunities to sell the dollar. So come Sunday, when we start the new week and we're looking for trading opportunities, um, if, you know, if we're still, I will let the market drive my um, my trades. If we're still in the red sell zone, we'll be looking for opportunities to sell dollar yen. If um, it actually reverses, and, you know, Friday's a big day, Sunday um, um, start of trade at 5 p.m. New York is a big period of time, if we squeeze upwards, we're back above um, the the blue line, the indicator line, then that tells me that the market's shifting its outlook. So, you know, while I may have opinion on how, um, and Boris may have opinion of how CPI may be and retail sales may be, um, we have to make sure that the charts um, give us the same vibe before getting into um, the trade. So um, right now, the daily charts look pretty good for a short trade. And dollar yen in some ways looks better than your dollar because we're at this resistance, but you know, the charts will change as the week progresses. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's Friday, right? We've all had a tough week of trading. I mean, it's definitely been a very <laughs> challenging week. Um, we're happy, you know, the doctor is in, I'm listening as they say, if, if, um, if, uh, anybody, in, in, you know, Anybody listening, guys, who have questions or uh, any kind of uh, issues, happy to uh, uh, to take some questions from the audience if you guys have any. Let us know. Well, I have a question for you, Boris. I mean, what are you looking for in terms for US 30 in the coming week? Um, so it's interesting. You know, I, everybody in the CFD land is trading US 30, but really the, the, the benchmark um, – index is the S&P, right? And the S&P is in this really tug of war zone at the 4,000 level. 4,000 was, they broke it to the downside. It's trading 3,900 now, right? And um, I think uh, we get very bearish if we break 3,800 on the S&P. Like that's going to be, I think the market is going to, that's, I think we break 3,800 if CPI comes in super hot, I'm, I'm just actually I, I, I don't have in front of us what the expectation is, but I wonder I wonder what they're looking for on the uh, um, on the on the hotness meter. Uh, where's the CPI? Uh, they're looking five six against five. So okay, let's just let me create a ridiculous scenario. CPI comes in six. We're, we're looking at five six. CPI comes in six. CPI comes in six. I think that's just going to decimate stocks. It's going to be hard. I can't imagine seeing the S and P you know, above 3,800. And that's going to do some serious long-term damage because because that really puts the Fed in a box of like, we got to go 50. Like the Fed funds rate, Fed funds rate is very funny. It was pricing 50, 1% price of 50. Then it went to 60% of price of 50 uh, last week. I think it's going to back down to like 1% of price of 50. And, you know, if CPI comes in, it'll just go psychotic again the other way. And that's what I mean about, um, about oh, what's going on over here. Oh, sorry, my, is it me? Uh, of my, my pinging over here. I have, I have like, you know, six or seven uh, algos running in the background here. So it's just uh, completely insane. Um, so, uh, so I guess my point is that 4,000 S&P, that's the cre critical level. If we can recapture that, that's going to squeeze a lot of shorts. Everybody who is uh, sort of structurally and, and cyclically short stocks is going to go, oh, you know, we're above this level. And it's going to create, I think, some very positive euphoria. That's what I would be looking for. That obviously, if the S if the S and P goes above four thousand, it's going to lift U.S. thirty along with it, and Nasdaq along with it. Nasdaq at you know thirteen thousand, like that that level is going to be big. So I'll be watching that, and I do think that next week, inflation is the is the hammer. That's as as we used to say in the in in the olden days when I used to trade OTC stocks. You know, who was the axe? Inflation is the axe, meaning that you know that's the that's the controller of the price flows next week. I know we have a uh, we have a question here, um, you know, coming through. Uh, what are your thoughts on oil? Well, I'll share. Well, you know, first of all, you know, I think the oil market has completely absorbed the impact of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. So right now, it's just about recession or no recession, or rate hikes, or you know, how big the rate hikes will be, and you know, just growth in general. So you know, today, you know, oil is up simply because you know uh, you, the dollar is down. Oil is price of dollars is a very tight relationship between these two. Um, I do believe, I personally believe 
that um, we're going to see a bit more U.S. dollar weakness next week. So that could lift oil a bit to maybe the 78 region. But overall, you know, growth um, is slowing. And I think that's, that's why we're trapped in this 73 to 82 range in oil and can't get out of it. And I think, you know, max move higher we'll see is maybe up to 78, 78-ish before it's just going to remain. The, the range is going to get, get more and more compressed. So, um, you know, yesterday I, I, I found a quote by Jesse Livermore, which was like a great quote. It was like sort of like the market's function is to make fools of as many people as possible. And um, I think, you know, he could have easily been talking about the oil market because I can remember every oil expert on my feed telling me that there was no chance that oil was not going to be $200 a, a barrel today because of the Russian invasion, cut off supplies, blah, 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 so on and so forth. And it was a disaster that we were, you know, opening up the SPR and all this stuff. And, you know, it turned out to be the greatest oil trader in the world was Joe Biden, which was just, I think, absolutely nobody in the world would have called that as, a, as an idea that, uh, that worked. But I think the oil market is very inscrutable at this point. You know, everybody, anytime everybody thinks that there's a bullish wave, China reopening, you know, Russia getting cut off more, it just seems to be that it's not having much of an impact on price. And I think this is a case where you really have to follow price. Right, right now, you have to assume it's basically a you know, sell the rally market until and unless we kind of clear 90. I, you know, I think anything underneath 90 is just all false breaks you know, in the oil market. And frankly, you know, we don't see that. And you know, thank God. I mean, honestly, the, the thing you want, to, you want to root for, oil at zero. That's what you want to root for because that's... <laughs> That, that makes that makes our life that makes the life in the U.S. incredibly wealthy. If if our energy, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm kidding. You, you you know you you actually you know what I take it back. What you really want to root for is exactly where we're at right now, because you want the U.S. oil industry to be as um, independent and as productive as possible. Its cost of extraction is somewhere around fifty five you know sixty dollars a barrel. So if we can keep the oil steady. At around 70 to 80, but not, you know, not so high that it kills the consumer, but not so low that it kills the producer. We're actually in a really great shape, you know, because we're just basically going to uh, take more and more market demand. So that's what, you know, we're kind of now in a kind of a Goldilocks moment in oil from a um, not from a trading point of view, but from an economic point of view, which is you know more important, I think. Right. So. Um, um, what about trading? How's you know how's your trading been, guys? Is uh, anybody get clipped on um, uh, on trading the NFPs or you know is it just this kind of choppy price action and in indices? Has it hurt people? I'm just wondering. You know, definitely been. We have just um, really had to adjust and adapt very very uh, swiftly to the change in market conditions on the indice side, where it used to be just you know straight up rallies, straight up trends, and now it's just you know, every rally is, is, is a, every, every breakout is a fake out. And more importantly, um, you really, you know, can't trade European hours because they're just dead. They're just completely uh, wavy. Um, and any kind of a trend trade you put in European hours is going to get decimated. So we've sort of like what I've done in the, um, in the indice market is we've adjusted our trading window. And this is another thing that I think Kathy can talk to this because she does this all the time is there's really only, Let's. I'll take the the indice market, and then you can talk about the FX market. I believe in the indice market, there is only the six hour sweetheart window. What that means is there's only six hours when everybody is serious during the day and they're moving markets, and that time frame is six a.m. New York till about noon New York, which is and what that what that translates to is basically um, Asia, you know, late early evening. Uh, morning london you know like like opening london all the way to the closing of london because if you, you know 12 midnight asia everybody goes to sleep uh london just basically goes you know has a drink and us pretty much finishes up all its business but if you have that that six hours you have us news you have everybody participating because you need as many people participating as possible in order to move prices and that's the sweetheart window these days in indices if you're going to day trade indices you want to trade them 6 a.m to, to 12 noon new york um what about on the FX side, Kate? Well, Boris and I are very different traders. 
I have been training the same strategy for the past seven years, and there's been no need to adjust despite COVID, despite, you know, the, the zero right. You know it's true, okay? <laughs> All the knives out of my back. You know, you know it's true. I, you know, he talked about how people hate change, yeah. and I'm, you know, I don't feel the need for change. Yeah. Um, and because it's because I've just, you know, been through a lot of market environments, and we fine tune our strategy already to adapt to that. And a large part of that, has to do exactly what Boris said, which is knowing what to trade, when to trade. And so for Zip, um, we have three sweet spots um, for trading. I love to trade the Asia Open. So I put on trades at 8 p.m. New York time, and oftentimes we carry that overnight. Um, we also trade the new early New York Open. So I lay on trades at 6.15 a.m. New York time. I'm not awake for the London Open, but Zip works really well between 2 to 4 a.m. New York time. And there's a good reason for that because Boris touched on this. We zip. I understand my own strategy in inside and out, which is that my strategy requires momentum, and in order for momentum, there needs to be participation, and that is why the market opens are the sweet spots for me to trade. To trade, you know, the Asia Open, the European Open, the um, New York Open in the early hours, and I'm actually done trading before by the time Boris starts trading. Um, because, you know, the equity market open creates a lot of um, volatility because people are adjusting their positions. The flow that you had expected overnight um, is already done. Everyone's done with their moves. So um, we complement each other very well because we trade different times of the day. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is that um, is that timing really matters. And, you know, trading your strategy well means understanding the times, you know, not not just randomly taking a breakout trade, you know, at 3 p.m. New York time when no one's around. You will need to know that, you know, um, your strategy will perform best, you know, at certain points a day. And we know for us that it's, at least for me, it's market opens. Well, one of the other um, questions that we got in here was, uh, you know, what is it? And you kind of touched on it a little bit here, Boris, which was what is the best time to trade US 30? You know, people are interested yeah. in that. So I think, you know, US 30, as I said, really 6 a.m. As a matter of fact, um, you know, my algos go to sleep until 6 a.m. and don't wake up and then they start trading it. So it's 6 a.m. until um, 12 noon is fine. You, you could put it to 3 p.m. New York. I mean, I think I think sort of 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. New York, you are in good hands in terms of trading the US 30. It's, a, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very decent time frame. This is this is basically when the Europeans and the Americans are there. To make markets to move prices uh you have news coming out globally and uh, everybody reacting remember in order for prices to move you have to have participation right that's that's what it is you know i was just yeah. i was i was at my um my little one's middle school um uh event yesterday and they had like a they had an auction you know so you know, so my, my my little girl goes to like this new york city public school but it's on the upper west side which is like it's you know it's just is exactly how you would expect. Like like Jason Jones from The Daily Show was the guy who was who's doing the auction. You know, it's just a whole bunch of very very Upper West Side parents. But what's interesting is like you know there, he was basically he 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 started like bidding. It, he was asking people you know contribute money to, to the school you know for the PTA and he started bidding like at five thousand dollars. He was like five thousand dollars, and there was like silence. Like nobody was willing to um, you know to offer that money. And he goes down four thousand. Nobody that. And then finally he got down to a thousand. People started started offering you know started offering money. Then he went down to like eight hundred. People started more and more and more. And it was just it was a perfect example how like a school auction can give you a a, a, a real understanding of how financial markets work, which is the exact same thing. It's a financial auction. You have to have price and participation in order to move prices. And that's why we look at levels. That's why we look at, you know, things. That's why when things get so expensive, nobody is willing to be buying at, you know, 5,000 um, right. on, uh, you know, whatever level and until it comes down and then you, then everybody materializes. So it was just a really interesting, fun lesson for me to, uh, to see that right. in real life. Yeah. Well, what I've experienced is, is, you know, right there, like you said, a market opens usually, like you said, market participation is yeah. at its highest. And then, you know, right around one, one thirty. You know, now, like you said, everybody's off at lunch as well. It's like lunch. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like an EKG, it's like an EKG that just goes silent, exactly. You know, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so we're excited like, about, you know, yeah. doing um, these kind of uh, live streams with Julian. And, you know, on Fridays, especially laid back, we're all done trading. <clears throat> I think that, 
you know, it's you know, these questions are great. Keep them coming. You know, we could talk more about strategies. And if you know your your um, viewers want to have questions about you know their own specific strategies, um, you can feel free to ask them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, no, one hundred percent. So I know, you know, and, and just like you had just touched on, obviously Mondays, you know, we'll come on here and, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about what to expect this next week. Obviously, I'll ask you guys this now. What, what do we expect after all the news, all the, you know, heavy reports, obviously with Powell coming in talking, you know, what does the overall picture look like? I think moving into the next week is what, you know, folks want to know. Um, and that's what we'll obviously cover on Mondays. We'll talk about it now. And then also, you know, on Fridays, of course, like you said, you know, time to now just kind of dissect everything how did the market go what were our predictions and you know did it did it go complete polar opposite or, or what happened so you know where do you think we're going moving moving into the next week with everything that's kind of you know transpired so i love that we're going to just to dissect whether what we said is right or wrong so i'm just going to say it i think the u.s dollar is going to weaken be weaker than where it is right now at the end of next week off of the inflation data and the retail sales sales, sales data we'll see if i'm right I think euro yeah. is going to be um, much stronger as well, trading you know well above the 107 handle. Um, that's what you know I'm very much keen on. Um, and you know we'll have lots of trades during the week. We can talk about some of the highlights of um, uh, the trades that went well, the trades that went poorly, dissect them, um, and look really at you know how our strategies are working. Um, but you know, I'm just going to put it out there. I like your. I think euro dollar is going to be well above 107. I think U.S. dollar in general is going to be weaker. Okay. Hmm. And Boris, what about you? What are you thinking? I, I, I have no predictions. I'll, I'll let her. I'll let her <laughs> flat on her face. You know, she's uh, she's, <laughs> she's she's got all the predictions. I'm I'm just I'm just a lowly day trader. Um, no, I, you know, I I again I um uh I don't have I, I I'm just watching the levels. I'm going to be reacting off my predictions. Like as I said, that that you know thirty. If we can take out the four thousand to the top side. Um, I really want to join the bid in inequities at that point, right? Because um, I think it's going to it's going to be. But you know, it could be a complete, completely different nightmare next week if if we get um, data that goes the other way. There's also you know, there's other stories that we'll I think we should we'll probably touch base on on Monday um, that are not necessarily um, uh, economic stories, but that could be a big impact. Which is the you know Silicon Valley Bank going bankrupt. You know, there's just Credit stories. There's always credit stories are always really interesting because they're always just kind of in the background. Nobody pays any attention until they all of a sudden come to the foreground, you know, yeah. because it's always some little guy who's got deposits of the whole world behind him on the thing. And if he goes bankrupt, the whole world goes down with him and suddenly it becomes a you know a big problem. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that and we'll see how crypto is trading also, because I think that's, you know, crypto is crypto is kind of an interesting asset that we haven't touched, touched on today is there's also kind of two ways about that, that it's, you know, it's coming back from the dead or it's just simply yet another false dawn. And, you know, we, we, we're going to 10,000 on the debt on the Bitcoin. You know, my view and this is just I don't have any fundamental reason for it. It's just my pure prejudice is I think Bitcoin goes to 10,000, not 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 30. But, uh, okay. you know, that will be my be my prediction. At least, you know, if I if I die on that hill, I'm very happy about it. Right. <laughs> Right. Well, it's, it's very interesting because, like you said, I mean, looking at just, you know, the S&P, the NASDAQ, you know, your USD, these these points that we have kind of pulled up, you know, week open, we had obviously that nice bell curve. And then we kind of have a bit of a rebound through all that heavy news. You know, we opened at thirty nine nine seven before, obviously, this morning. And then, you know, now uh, Thursday, just yesterday, we're at four thousand five, you know, meaning the yeah. S&P yeah. and, you know, nasdaq we've got you know 11 520 and then thursday it's 11 620 you know so yeah. it's it's very it's interesting with all the noise going on like you said and, and to your point that you had said before boris which is you know when you see you know the the lows get taken out or whatever in my experience at least it usually always wants to come back to a nice equilibrium you know very rarely does it just continue to continue to just fall and tank but it was it was odd i kind of got snipped on uh on us 30 just trying to take it to another level um, what was it yesterday or two days ago right. when it really took over? And I look back at the market about three o'clock, it's down 700, 800 points. I'm like, Oh my goodness. You know, it was, it was, yeah. pretty, pretty no, it is, you know, yeah, it, that's, that's why that's, it's always nuanced. You gotta know, you gotta know when there's going to be continuity and right. most of the time it's reversal, but when there's important stuff going on, it's continuity. And that's the most important bet in the markets. That's really the only bet you can make. I mean, Kathy and I basically essentially trade primarily continuity and we stand, we try to stand aside 
um, into a reversal type of regime, you know, into, into, into kind of a chop regime. Um, that's sort of our trade. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, all right. So it sounds, sounds like everybody had a pretty good week. I don't have any uh, other questions. We're happy, you know, if you guys want to have more questions for us on Monday, we'll, we'll take some of those too, as far as your strategy questions. But we're going to be looking forward to coming back and uh, getting ready for another great week of trading with you guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for, for coming on today. Obviously, you know, sharing your knowledge, kind of diving into the other, you know, commodities indices, you know, just other, you know, FX, that kind of deal. Um, this is obviously super helpful for, you know, our viewers here, uh, for my viewers. And, and like I said, we'll make sure we have a round of questions for you guys as we, you know, move forward. Great. Great. We we'll look right. forward to After it. After all, have a good weekend, everyone. Bye, guys. You as well. You and remember, daylight savings. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. exactly. It's follow, gonna, it's gonna follow, 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 follow us on Twitter. It's Kathleen FX at Kathleen FX and yeah. FX Flow. FX, F I'm actually I'm going to post a YouTube video tonight um, on how daylight savings affects trading, uh, which I think you know, everyone will find valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, community, tune into that. Make sure you guys are following Kathy. Make sure you guys are following Boris as well. Can you guys put your, uh, you know, your handles in the uh, in the chat as well so they can, you know, refer to it? That'd be great. Sure, sure, sure. sure. I'll let Boris do that because we we only have I only have access to the private chat. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. Wait, but which I, chat are we talking about? Kathy Lean FX. <laughs> K A T H Y L O N F X. Sorry, no, no. I, I actually I, I put in the wrong thing because because I got confused here. FX flow, that's mine. Yeah. And at Kathy Lean FX. That's the private chat for us. Okay, well, you know what? They can repost it. Exactly. No worries. We'll grab it, we'll send it out. Don't worry, we'll make sure everything's there. Um, guys, uh, it, it was a pleasure. Um, like I said, we will see you Monday. We'll kind of go over everything, get ready for the, you know, the, the next week here. And then obviously Friday we'll come back and, and talk about what, <laughs> what really happened. Great. Sounds great. Thank All you. Right, guys, have a good Bye. weekend. Bye.